We know that close contact is how this disease is passed on. Always stay two meters away from people you don't live with. Every time you try to flex the rules, that could be fatal. Do as I say, not as I do. Is there a more dangerous maxim in politics? Matt Hancock is about to find out. Throughout the pandemic, there has been no one who has been a more fierce, perhaps more aggressive advocate of the lockdown guidance and legal standards than he. You asked about hugging people. Uh, when people have had both jabs, then it is, uh, it, it, that, is that is pretty safe. Right. Okay. But you shouldn't still spend a lot of time in close okay. proximity. You should make sure ventilation's good. We all know what we can do and take personal responsibility. And and yet here is the same Matt Hancock on May the 10th in his office at the Department of Health, very much not social distancing, in the grip of his aide, Gina Collidangelo, at a time where you weren't even supposed to hug a relative at a funeral. And other ministers said that this was a private matter. He does have my support. This is a personal matter. You know, I understand that he hasn't broken any of the rules. But is it really just a personal or private matter? Leave aside the charge of hypocrisy, of which there is no doubt. Leave aside the question of breaking guidance, which Mr Hancock accepts. Leave aside the fact that private matters in this strange age of ours have been public matters. The question is whether Mr Hancock has broken the law, not just the guidance. Statutory instruments issued in his own name as Secretary of State for Health. He were the rules in place at the time um, were the step two rules um, at, at the beginning of May. And that meant that nobody could meet indoors um, with another person unless they fell within one of the exceptions. And the only exception I could think of potentially applying is that what they were doing was reasonably necessary for work. But it's very hard to understand how what we see in the pictures from the sun could have been reasonably necessary for work. It looked like an entirely private matter. And even before today, there were questions about the employment of Ms Collidangelo, an old university friend of the health secretary. We met at the student radio station, Oxygen FM. I read the news and Matt read the sport. I've always joked with him that he did the sport because he wasn't good enough to do the news. <laughs> she was initially appointed as an unpaid advisor, and then after Mr Hancock appointed her to the board of the Department of Health, a board which is supposed to oversee the department, which Mr Hancock heads, receives a £15,000 taxpayer stipend in the process. It's a matter of proprietary and it's a matter of transparency. Um, there are codes of conduct about special advisors, civil servants, ministers, and also about non-executive directors. And we know that she then became a non-executive director at the Department of Health. So she would have had to have signed up to conflicts of interest. This exposes another question that's not really been tackled in British politics, which is what kind of a conflict of interest a personal relationship brings to a role like this, because that kind of influence over the, prime, over the minister, um, access to the minister, that could affect how officials treat them, um, how, how the power balance works in that relationship. Then there are questions about Mr Hancock's wider credibility and relationship with the truth. He has claimed to have put a protective ring around care homes, something denied by every player in the sector, something Dominic Cummings, then advisor to the Prime Minister, has said was completely untrue. The Secretary of State for Health should have been fired for at least 15, 20 things, including lying to everybody in multiple occasions, in meeting after meeting in the, in the cabinet room and publicly. He has also claimed that there was no national PPE shortage and that the National Audit Office has explicitly confirmed this, but they have not. Comparisons have been made all day between this episode and Dominic Cummings' rather ill-starred escapade to Barnard Castle. But here is a very big difference. Outside of this place, SW1, Dominic Cummings was largely unknown. The same cannot be said for Matt Hancock, who has been one of the principal faces of the government's response to the pandemic and has achieved an unusual level of notoriety and fame even for a health secretary. Conservative MPs will therefore worry that the potential for political damage is still greater and public health experts will worry that his personal credibility in delivering public health messaging for the remainder of the pandemic 
has now gone. And then another question, not for Mr. Hancock, but for the Prime Minister, lingering over his government, whispered in Whitehall. What now is the threshold for ministerial resignation? And what does that mean for standards in our public life? Lewis, good all there. Now, we did ask the government for a minister to speak to us tonight, but they declined. We also tried for backbenchers to defend the health secretary. Again, no one was available. Instead, we're joined by the chair of the Labour Party, Annalise Dodds, and Professor Stephen Riker, a behavioural scientist from the University of St Andrews. He serves on the government's spy B board. Now, uh, first to you, Annalise Dodds. Uh, the health secretary has apologised. Uh, is that not the end of the matter? Sadly, it can't be the end of the matter because not only yet again do we see here a senior Conservative behaving like the rules simply don't apply to him, but there are those really big questions about appointments here. Why we have a situation that an advisor who obviously had a very close link to the Health Secretary was also then appointed effectively to challenge his work this simply is a mess, cronyism on cronyism. And frankly, if the health secretary himself will not resign, then the prime minister should remove him. So are you alleging here that uh, Matt Hancock, I mean, he says he didn't break the guidance. Are you, are you suggesting that there's some sort of legal issue? Well, I think many people looking at the health secretary's words here will really be scratching their heads and they will be thinking through what they themselves have done over these months when we've seen grandparents not able to cuddle their grandkids, people in care homes having to just look at their relatives through the window, not able to even see them in person. Now, people have been following those rules, whether we call them guidance, rules, prescriptions, everyone's known what they were, not least the health secretary himself. After all, he's been promoting them night after night in the media and indeed he's been promoting them in parliament so there's no excuse here and it's absolutely critical at this stage that people can have trust in what they're being asked to do this is a really important stage of the pandemic and it's the time when this health secretary should stand down and if he won't as i said the prime minister must get a grip on this and remove him but but you'd acknowledge that ministers shadow ministers have the right to a personal life a private life Absolutely. And I frankly could not care less about what people do in their private lives. That's not what's at stake here. What is at stake here is the use and misuse of taxpayers' money, whether appointment standards have been followed and whether those rules and regulations have been followed by senior Conservatives in the way that everyone else in the country has been following them. It just feels like there's one rule, frankly, if you're a senior Conservative, and a very different rule for everybody else, and that's not on. But I, I put it to you that you've tried to throw mud against the government over a series of issues. When push comes to shove in the local elections in, in Hartlepool, voters have noticed not that, they've noticed the fact that our vaccination programme has been world-beating that's what they ultimately care about when push comes to shove. Well, look, I'm absolutely delighted at the success of that vaccination programme. Led and I by couldn't Matt Hancock. pay enough tribute to those who've been delivering the vaccine, to the thousands of volunteers, the GPs, the nurses. And frankly, this is about something much, much bigger than whether one party might be up in the polls or down in the polls and what's happening in elections. This is about our country getting out of this crisis, the worst public health crisis in living memory. Well, the vaccinations the run by his country. department that are getting us out of the crisis. I'm so sorry, could you say it's that the again? The vaccinations run by his department that are getting us out of the crisis. Well, I'm afraid that what I see up and down the country, and I've been to a number of vaccination centres, is not actually government ministers delivering that vaccine into people's arms. It's hard working nurses, doctors and volunteers. And actually, funnily enough, I was speaking with some of those nurses from my local area this morning, and they were very clear that they feel that they've been succeeding in this very often in spite of the Conservative government, rather than necessarily with its backing.
Well, let's bring in Professor Riker. You advise the government on behavioural responses. What is the evidence for the mass public response to uh, stories like this about uh, senior government ministers or advisers um, uh, not necessarily taking their own advice? The evidence is very clear, and I think we only have to look back to the Cummings affair. The thing about this Cummings affair, which made it truly toxic, was not what Dominic Cummings did himself. It was when the Prime Minister defended him, and therefore an individual indiscretion turned into a systemic issue, a sense of there's one rule for us and another rule for them. And so for me, the Hancock affair changed when, again, the Prime Minister rode in and defended him, again giving rise to that sense of uh, if you are uh, one of the government, an advisor, a minister, you're treated in one way, but the rest of us are treated differently. And once you have a sense of them and us, it critically undermines trust. You have a sense of the government as not looking after us, not on our side, but as other, um, as imposing upon us. And in the week or two after the Cummings affair, trust in government plummeted so much that the pollsters were shaking their heads and wondering if they got it wrong. It plummeted by about 20% in a week. It went down from nearly 80% to around 30%. Now, you might argue there is so little trust now, there's little more to squander. But nonetheless, in the midst of a huge national crisis, we want a government uh, we trust and we want a government that we're going to listen to. And right now, Professor Riker, it is a very sensitive time, isn't it? Because it, many in the public may be beginning to tire of some of these restrictions, wondering why they have to do them. Some of them have had two vaccinations. I don't know, anecdotes from the football on Tuesday was that I heard football fans booing the, the suggestions that we should all wear masks. Um, mm. Public uh, patients may be wearing thin. Do you think this makes the, this situation even more uh, tense? Well, let me give you a very concrete example. One of the critical things, as Matt Hancock himself tells us, in terms of the spread of infection, and remember that while the vaccinations are going very well, still less than half of the whole population is infected. There are still some 20 million adults who aren't infected. Uh, sorry, who aren't, uh, who aren't vaccinated, fully vaccinated yet. So our behaviour matters. Uh, the numbers of contacts we have with others is critical. Now, before the pandemic, we on average had about 11 uh, contacts uh, in a week. Now it's down to about four. If it went back up to 11, then the second wave would be huge and we'd be even in even deeper trouble than we are now. So you need a government and you need a health secretary who can persuade people that it's important for us to limit our contacts for our own safety. Now, the question is, can Matt Hancock do his job, do that job? He might stay in office, but can he do his job? And I think it is fatally compromised in a situation where he does not seem to abide by the evidence that he wants us to follow, and which is critical to our safety and making sure that this third wave isn't much bigger than we fear. Let me, let me bring Annalise Dodds uh, back in. I mean, uh, some would argue the opposition has given a blank cheque uh, to the health department in terms of the restrictions. You may have to uh, approve a further extension of restrictions. Haven't, have you really been holding this health secretary and this health department to account uh, on these crucial issues? Well, absolutely. And on a number of occasions, we've argued, for example, that the government should have imposed restrictions much sooner. Um, if we had indeed had the kind of circuit break that was imposed in Labour-run Wales, then we could have been in a very different situation going into the winter. Of course, we've also consistently said that the Health Secretary and indeed the Chancellor have to get a grip on self-isolation. That's been a failing of this government since the very beginning of the pandemic, one which indeed SAGE itself, as that ex expert body has highlighted. So we have been okay. critical when we've needed to get our country to a better place. Of course, when the government has done the right thing, we've supported them. We are in the middle of a national crisis, but Thanks. when they've done the wrong thing or they haven't acted, we've pointed that out very strongly indeed. Must leave that there. Thanks for joining us, Annalise Dodds and Professor Stephen Riker.